sometimes you do have to shut the f up. Why are they giving me this song? I used to hate it. And Soriano, he is freaking fabulous. Yeah. What the women wanted at that time was the ability to be their very best version of themselves. Welcome everyone to Ring the Bell, this is DS, and today we are here with the queen of strut, the legend of feeling me, Crystal Marshall, yeah! Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me on. How are you? You look amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, you know, trying to keep it together. Today we're going to go through your journey through the world of pro wrestling. I want to start a little before the diva search because there was a time you were an alum along with Meghan Markle, deal or no deal, when you were a briefcase model. Yeah, I was uh, a part of deal no deal for the pilot and a bit of the first season. And it's funny because I look at like what that show has become and it's just so weird that I'm going to be cemented amongst that. When I was in my early 20s, it kind of went by so fast and there were so many experiences that I had that, you know, now that I'm older now, I look back on and I reflect and I'm like, whoa, like you didn't take that in, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And uh, I kind of wish I did. Definitely excited to be a part of that. The other video was pretty cool. <laughs> so from your modeling background to applying for WWE Diva Search, how did you learn about this opportunity? And were you a wrestling fan before this? Funny story, my grandmother, who's now passed away, um, she immigrated here from Barbados in the Caribbean. And when she moved here, we lived in Brooklyn, New York. And we had very few television channels. And I remember going to visit my grandmother and no matter what, wrestling was always on so it's really funny because i remember watching it with her and some of her favorites was um brooklyn brawler that was her favorite i remember just getting into the storyline not so much because i was a wrestling fan but because it was a bonding thing for us mm. and it kind of became the thing that we did together wrestling and deal no deal kind of blended together at the same time so i shot deal no deal's pilot and shortly after that my manager was like, hey, listen, we don't really have anything else for you right now. Just kind of hang tight. Let's see what happens with Deal No Deal. And I was like, are you sure? I think, I'm pretty sure there's something. She's like, well, there is this one thing. It's through the WWE. And she was like, you really don't want to do that. <laughs> and I was like, think about it. I was like, actually, I literally want to do that. Deal No Deal got picked up and mm -hmm. it was right during the time of the diva search. And I had to pick, oh. do I want to pursue this or do I want to go, you know, the safe route with Deal No Deal? I knew... To some extent, it was going to be successful, but I also knew that that journey was going to be really, really safe. And if any, if you know me, like anybody knows me, I'm a risk taker. I love to try new things. I love to push my ideas and my thoughts. I like to be challenged. And I was like, hell yeah, we're going to go <laughs> to the wrestling route. So the 2005 Diva Search, what were your favorite memories from that competition? I think a lot of my favorite memories were spent with Ashley Massaro and oh, okay. Elizabeth Rufar, who didn't go into the route of wrestling. But I mean, I remember so much of being backstage and I had my laptop and we used to watch Dave Chappelle all the time. Oh. That's what we did. We would just watch Dave Chappelle. We would laugh. And then in our downtime, we would go shopping and try to find outfits and, and things that kind of play into whatever image we wanted to portray during the diva search. So, I mean, I know it's very general, but there's just so many with those girls that it's kind of hard to really pinpoint one. So after diva search, you were signed by WWE and they wanted you to report to DSW Deep South Wrestling. How did that whole conversation come about? It was awesome. I kind of expected to hear from them, oh. but I didn't want to assume. So when they mm -hmm. called me, I was like, hey, what's up? Oh, for real? Okay, you're gonna make it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'll go. That's kind of how it was. I knew it was coming. It was just something that I had no idea what I was getting myself into. But being the headstrong person that I am, I was like, it'll be great. I'll do great. This is gonna be great. <laughs> so, walked away from deal no deal and probably my chance of marrying Prince Harry to pursue my uh, <laughs> career in wrestling. Here I am. It was rare for women to get that training before jumping into WWE. A lot of diva search girls were just plunged into the ring without much training. How was it like to put into that training program before going into WWE? If it were me and I hired on these girls who are all awesome and have so much to contribute to the wrestling world besides just wrestling, mm -hmm. I do think that there is something to be to be taken away from the experience of wrestling school. As much as you can within a short period of time, you build up something that I like to refer to as sweat equity. Hmm. You know, you really figure out like, is this what I want to do? How do I tell a story? How do I connect with the audience? You have to also show respect for the women mm -hmm. and the men that came up the hard way. I don't know how the environment is now. I know a lot has changed since mm -hmm. I left, yeah. but 
The wrestling business is an art and it's been around and it's something to be respected. It's something to cherish. And it's something that if you're going to be a part of the business, you need to to see it and to understand it. I'm really <laughs> grateful that I had that experience. How long were you training there for? I was exclusively at Deep South. I want to say maybe six months. But my entire time that I was on the road wrestling, I was still reporting to Deep South Wrestling. Also. Oh. So when I was wrestling, traveling with SmackDown, my days that I was off, I was still required to still report to Deep South, to still participate. That tapered off towards the end when my demands kind of became more. But I was doing that probably close to the end of my career. How was that whole experience like? Especially with women like Michelle McCool was there too. Yeah, Michelle was there. Michelle was definitely there. Michelle was there for a while. I, I'm not sure exactly how long she was there, but I do know that she was there before I got there. Hi, I'm Michelle McCool. And I'm loving life. Loving life. Loving life. How was it like to see her like meteoric rise all the way from developmental area, making her name in the WWE women's division? I'm happy for her. I'm happy for her success. And I think that she proved a lot of naysayers wrong. She was a model and a teacher and not a wrestler. And she came in and she did the work and she deserves mm -hmm. where, where she's at. You know, she's going to be cemented as one of the greats. I do, however, wish I was coming up in this era now because mm -hmm. there's so many more opportunities for women to have strong characters and to display their athleticism, which wasn't really necessarily the case when mm. I was coming up. There's always plenty of pie for everybody, you know? So I'm, I'm really happy to see some of the girls that I know come Got up it. and be successful. So you were finally called up to WWE SmackDown as a backstage interviewer. And this was an interesting time for women's division because it was very transitional time where a lot of the veterans were leaving. And then there's tons of new women that came in with not much experience. So how was it like walking into the locker room then? I'm not gonna lie, it was intimidating okay. for sure because I know what the perception was of the girls that came in as models or whatever. You know, we were afterthought. I can't speak for everybody else, but for me, I try to stay out of the way, do my job, keep my head down, and that was that. Yeah, it was surreal seeing like Trish Stratus and Lita. Were they the women that you admired most coming into the industry? Oh, absolutely, especially Trish. Because Trish came from a background similar to mine. You know, she's mm. a fitness model, fitness competitor, and you know, lo and behold, she is the best of the best. It is kind of neat to to be a part of that and to be in the locker room with her, to have her talk to you. It's like, <laughs> I did stand out a little bit. I mean, given that there is so much dichotomy of different experience level, how did that division like function? Was there like a mentor mentee system or was there like a ring leader that was teaching everyone? You know, not necessarily. It's kind of like, like I said, you have your pecking order. You got your veterans, hybrid wrestlers and managers mm -hmm. like Molina. You have you have a little bit of everything. You kind of just take from everybody's pot. You take mm. from some of the male veterans. You take from Stephanie McMahon. You know, everybody that's a part of the process, you learn from. If you have not been a part of the business, my advice to you once you get to the business is shut your mouth, keep your eyes open, and try to learn as much as you can from everybody because everybody contributes to the show. It's not Got just it. about the main ticket person. It's not about, you know, just the women's match. It's about the dark matches. It's about the production. It's about all the elements that come together to make the show great. There's something to learn from everybody. If you're not talking to lighting and pyro, and if you're not talking to security, then you are missing, and you're missing so much that you'll regret later on. Your first televised match was Divas Uncovered match with Jillian Hall. Lord. How prepared were you walking into this match? <laughs> I was training at Deep South. I was learning holds. I was learning learning how to fall. I was learning all of these things, but I still hadn't really pieced it all together. Mm. I had no idea how to follow a leader in a match. I was green as green. And that is a true testament to Jillian Hall. And let me tell you, <laughs> Jillian does not get the credit that she deserves, but she is probably one of the best, the best teachers out there, especially wow. for women. And she did the best she could. I can't say that it was my best match, <laughs> but you know, it's, um, it's one of those things that you can never really explain the feeling of going to an arena and seeing the stamps full of people being expected to perform that is the most terrifying and the most euphoric feeling wow. and it's something that you can try to chase for the rest of your life 
through various platforms, but you'll never, ever, ever be able to compare it to the feeling of being in a ring. It's it's something that just cannot be explained. Taking my clothes off in front of a bunch of people, that was new, but I got really good at it, so. <laughs> During this match, you were a bubbly face, but what really made a strong impression with so many fans is when you turned heel, and that strut. We have to talk about that strut because you are the queen of strut. Okay, so I never really had the opportunity to interact with Paul Heyman, but there was one thing he said to me and I caught him next to the ring one day and I asked him, I said, hey, you know, like, I'm really trying to develop an entrance. Like, can you help me? Like, what should I do? And he was just like, what do you mean? What should you do? He's like, when you walk into a room, all eyes are on you, right? Yeah, I guess so. And he's like, well, what else needs to be done? So I just took that and I just ran with it. Wow. And that's how the strut came to be. <laughs> I did not expect Paul Heyman would be the one to give you the idea yeah. of strut. Yeah. I mean, your strut is so iconic. Even when nowadays, when women try to strut down the ramp, everyone's like, they've got nothing on Crystal. I see it. And I'm like, thank you, honey. Thank you for the nod. And we also have to talk about feeling me. The legendary feeling me. <laughs> It's I like, used to hate that song. I used to hate it. I was so, I was like, why are they giving me this song? <laughs> Everybody else has an awesome song and this is my song. Why is this my song? I love it now. I mean, I looked at the lyrics and I listened to it and I'm like, well, that kind of fits. Like, <laughs> I can tell you're me. You know what's so funny though? What's funny is like, I think I'm more popular now than I was then. It's mm -hmm. the weirdest thing. And I don't know why that is. I like get on Instagram and I'm like looking at the followers and then people are sending me stuff about my strut and these little videos. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and it makes me feel pretty good. I was like, damn, I was trying to like make y'all feel me then, but everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that even like Sasha Banks and Bailey used feeling me at one point in their career? Hey, Sasha Banks. Bailey. I do. You know what's so great about Sasha is like, I've never met her, but her and I have kind of touch and go through social media throughout the years. And I just, I love seeing her grow and develop. I'm no Sasha Banks, but I do see little bits of like divas before that she's kind of pulled from. Mm -hmm. And it makes me feel so good because we didn't all have those opportunities, you know, to develop into these strong characters and these amazing performers. So it feels good to have a bit of that acknowledgement. And I love seeing that in the Divas division now. Like mm -hmm. even with the Divas show and some of the other opportunities that the girls get now, I know for a fact that girls of my generation, even before, were kind of like really pushing for some of that. So it's so nice to see some of that. And I am just like looking forward to seeing where the Divas division and the women's division will be in the next five years, 10 years. It's going to be something else for sure. Speaking of the outside opportunities, I have to talk about one thing that I was obsessed with. It is Project Runway <laughs> WWE <laughs> Diva episode. What was your experience being in the episode? Because you slayed. Yes, we did. Um, <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. And a couple things that I wanted to talk about with Project Runway that I don't think that any of the other divas have pointed out in the past. And it's not to get all political or anything, but... <laughs> Heidi Klum is amazing and the people that she hires to work with us backstage, I can tell that they're family and mm. that was probably one of the warmest experiences that I've ever had on any set, hands down. As far as my designer, Christian Soriano, he is freaking fabulous. Yeah. Like everything that I wanted, he created and he's talented. I mean, as you can see him now in his career. He's and huge. These are one of those moments that like in my life, like I tell you, it was a blur that I look back on and I'm like, holy shit. Like I worked with Christian Soriano, like what kind of crap was I smoking that I did not absorb <laughs> all of that at the time, you know? But I feel really blessed to have all these experiences and it's just fabulous to see, you know, what's going on with his career. So looking back at the episode, there were some points where they didn't really understand WWE or they made some fun of WWE. I feel like the Pope at a sex club. <laughs> Kind of ridiculous runway show. I can lose losing it. <laughs> what did you think of that? You know, I feel like there's a lot of people that don't understand the business, and I do think that it's changing. And I think a great deal of that is because of our women's division, and it mm -hmm. is because of the total divas. So I think during that time, we were at a tipping point 
in the business to where people, we were starting to branch out into other areas of entertainment besides movies and kind of have more face time with people outside of the ring and outside of our controlled environment of WWE. Mm -hmm. I think Heidi Klum said that I was scary at one point. <laughs> yeah. I'd be very intimidated and scared to have to fight you in the ring, you know? <laughs> Heidi versus Crystal. <laughs> Next but episode. You know, it's not like, you know. It's funny, I don't I don't take it as an insult. You know, I'm playing a character. I am a character. So I did my job, right? <laughs> yeah. The one question though we have about the episode is why did none of you wear that in WWE? I think the winner was the only one that was able to keep the outfit. Oh uh, as okay. far as I'm concerned. Because I think afterwards Maria ran with that outfit and kind of made it ring gear and oh, made different got it. variations of it. So I think that's what it was. But you weren't given the piece. No. Sad. <laughs> I know. I know. I would wear that to Whole Foods right now. <laughs> and the other fashion iconic moment from you is the Halloween match when you wore the gold digger outfit. Uh, <laughs> Whose idea was that? It was mine. Yeah, it was a pretty good one. I'm thinking about repeating that at some point. That's yes. Good. So let's talk about some of the most iconic rivalries that you had in SmackDown. And of course, with Ashley Massaro. I finished fourth. What was your relationship like with Ashley? You know, Ashley and I have always been pretty close, especially through the Diva Search experience and rolling that into our time on SmackDown. But her and I, you know, we still kept in contact through the years. I shared a hotel room with her last January before she passed. And, you know, it's what's really cool about the business is that even though you might not have worked on a specific brand with somebody, you have like a like a familiar sisterhood, brotherhood relationship with them. When you have that with somebody and you're working a storyline with them, what's awesome is that you trust that person. You know that if something happens out there that they're going to protect you and have your best interests at mind and they're not going to take liberties to make you look stupid or anything like that. And we definitely had that for sure. And how did her passing affect you last year? You know, it was it's it still affects me. It's really, really hard. Um, a lot of things don't make sense, but I think with suicide in general, it's just one of those things that no matter how hard you try to think about it and explain it away and dissect it, it's never going to make sense on why. You know, maybe if I reached out or maybe if I lived closer, maybe there's something I could have done. But the reality is, is you can't live with that guilt because when somebody has that their mind made up that they're going to end their life, that decision has been made and there's not much that you can do other than prolong it. So definitely if somebody's in that dark place and they feel helpless, you should definitely reach out and get some professional help. Let's talk about other rivalry that was super iconic. It was with Layla L. Oh man, I remember when Layla won the Diva Search and she was just, I love her so much. She's just a ball of nerves. She was just so nervous. She didn't want to upset anybody. She was, did I hurt you? Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't mean to. You just tell me what I need to do. I'll do it, I love you. <laughs> She's just, she's a sweetheart. You know, Layla is, who Layla is, just a sweet, kind, caring person. You know, hardworking. We're still friends to this day. Yeah, I was actually a bridesmaid in her wedding. You know, your rivalry with Layla was so iconic because I can't even remember the last time we saw a rivalry and storyline between two POC women. You know, that was well after likes of Jazz and Jacqueline has left the company. You know what's so funny is at the time, I didn't think much about it. Mm -hmm. I think part of it was because I was young. Looking back at it now, no matter how wrestling history goes, it can never be taken away. Yeah. That I was one of the few women of color that helped shape and mold the women's division. It was awesome working with Layla. I, I mean, if she was green, hell, it would have been awesome too, you know? <laughs> but <laughs> I guess I haven't really thought that much about it. I just know that it's important. Mm -hmm. And I know that representation is important. And I know that I like when I watch the program that I see so much representation right now and it's something that needs to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And not just about race, religion, about sexuality, all of it needs to be represented because this is the world that is changing. Yeah. So I think WWE is doing a really good, a good thing with it. Mm -hmm. And I hope they'll continue to grow. Yeah. And hopefully a lot of the storylines can start pushing some boundaries and start you know, exposing people that maybe live in an area where they're not exposed to people of color or homosexuals or people from different religious groups, they can start getting a little bit of a taste of what that's like and start to humanize these groups of people. 
that's how progress is made. There was a stereotype about WWE that they only really like blonde white women like Trish, Sable, Michelle McCool, or even to point Charlotte Flair. Uh, so being there in the backstage in the start of Diva era, did you feel like you were held back to a point because you were a POC? I'm going to say this. I've been in the entertainment business for a long time in different facets of it. And this is not a WWE thing across the board in entertainment for a very long time. There has not been representation of attractive, powerful, smart, beautiful women of mm -hmm. color. There just hasn't been. So to sit here and say that, oh, it's just WWE, it's not, it's not. But the thing is, the world now is diverse. The world now looks like you, it looks like me, it looks like many other people that are multi-ethnic. And I think that this is the first time that I can say, I, I think that they're doing a great job. It is diverse, it is changing. You don't see a bunch of people with perfect bodies. There are all kinds of different body types, shapes, and I'm for it. Even in my previous interview with MJ Jenkins, who was in NXT, she talked about being so inspired by you. The fact that you were there wow. kicking ass was really what pushed her to become a wrestler. That is so crazy. You know, like when I joined the business, I was 21 years old and I certainly was not thinking about changing anybody's world. I was thinking about partying, uh, going out, <laughs> traveling, seeing the world. I'm just happy that I was my authentic self and mm -hmm. that somebody was able to latch onto that and make something out of themselves because of that. And I hope that I continue to inspire people. That means a lot. Talk a little bit more about the representation. Let's talk about WWE's treatment of women back then. It was very much over-sexualized and there was definite focus on the sex appeal of women. Was there any like movement among women to kind of push to show different narratives, different sides? This is from my perspective. Let me just say that. Mm -hmm. From my perspective, the women in the locker room, myself included, we felt very stifled. We felt very stifled because for the women that are, were true legit wrestlers, they had to dumb themselves down to Got fill it. a role at the time. Now, I say that to say this. Everybody has to bring an ingredient to the potluck to make the meal work. And at that time, we were in a different era and we were serving a different menu than what's being served now. So when you have a group of people that want to showcase their talent in a different arena and they can't a lot of times it can be their frustration can be misconstrued as not being appreciative or being defiant or being that nasty f word feminist but that wasn't necessarily the case what the women wanted at that time was the ability to be their very best version of themselves and i think that that fire that was lit by those women before is completely burning hard and bright right now. Because as you see, the women's division is thriving. Yeah. They are serving looks. Naomi is wearing her natural hair. Yes. Such a huge thing. Amazing. It is great. It is a time to really just like sit back and be appreciative that we are part of this. At the time, I felt a little slighted. Hey, I can't wrestle. I am a backstage interviewer only. But you know what? I'm a part of something bigger. Whenever you were in a ring, just the way you moved, it was so fluid. Like there was so much potential. Did you yeah. feel like you had way more to show in the ring? Absolutely. Especially now, especially after I stopped wrestling and really got into fitness, like my full athleticism was never even remotely touched on. I know for a fact, if I had the opportunity to train more and to have bigger matches and to have what the women in NXT have, which is a forum to grow and develop as a character and as an athlete, the sky was absolutely the limit for me. You know, if the opportunity ever comes again that I'm given those same opportunities to, to do that. Maybe you are a Rumble or Evolution 2 or something like that. That would be freaking badass. <laughs> a lot of the people asked, like, did you develop a finisher back then? I did really like and I wanted to develop the leg DDT mm -hmm. as a finisher but I never again had an opportunity to display it. And I think with a lot of the Divas matches, that's part of why their characters were never developed because our matches never really warranted a finisher because a lot mm. of it was kind of a segue into something else. And also just among SmackDown locker room, what was it feel? Because it seemed like Raw had the women's title back then, but it was before Divas Championship was introduced in SmackDown. Was there a call for a secondary championship back then? I think right... After I left, mm -hmm. there was. Okay. I know there was a lot of frustration with some of the worker females on SmackDown because they're like, hey, how am I ever going to have an opportunity to wrestle if the belt is over on Raw? 
So I know there was a time when women were wanting to get to Ross, they could wrestle more, for sure. I mean, you talked a little bit about uh, enjoying working with Layla and Jillian Hall. Who were some other women that you really enjoyed working in the ring? Well, I really didn't have an opportunity to work with many more. I really wanted to work with Melina. I think that would have been good for me. I wanted to work with Victoria and Trisha, of course. I wanted to kind of expand my palette a bit and kind of see what it felt like to work with different people Mm -hmm. and see what I can learn from them and what they could teach me. Later in your career, you were put in the very high profile storyline with Teddy Long, which eventually led to huge, huge wedding. I mean, that was a big storyline on SmackDown. What was it like learning that you will be in that storyline? It was freaking awesome. It was everything <laughs> that, you know, I wanted it to be. We discussed it and uh, and other things happened. <laughs> So. You know, after the wedding segment, you were gone from the TV and the storyline kind of dropped. Like, did you know where it was supposed to be going? Not really. Sometimes we write as we go. I had an idea where it was going to go, but there was never any concrete direction. So that caused a lot of confusion. And my inquiries is ultimately what led to me being labeled as difficult and hard to work with, and that was it. A little bit after your disappearance, you were released by WWE, which was shocker to all of us, including me, because you were in such a big storyline right before. And then there were so many speculations about what happened backstage. Some said something about your ex-fiance, Bobby Lashley. Some said about a storyline with Edge. But what can you tell about what exactly happened back then? I don't know. I wanted to get more information on the storyline. I couldn't, for whatever reason. I didn't know anything about the Edge storyline. I They were keeping a lot under wraps for me. And I inquired about what was going on. And I think sometimes what I've learned through life is when you're a woman and you're outspoken and you're an advocate for yourself, you get labeled as difficult. You get labeled as hard to work with. And people don't like that. And wow. I, unfortunately, I am not a flaw line kind of person. I'm going to speak my mind, right, wrong, or indifferent. And... I feel like the problem with that is that I was just starting to get to know the higher ups on a more personal level and it was bad timing on my part. I should have probably gone more with the flow and just waited until I built more of a relationship to voice some of my concerns and ultimately that worked against me. You know, sometimes you do have to shut the fuck up and just wait until you can get to the next position to where you can speak up for yourself. Wow. Wow. So it was just backstage politics that really caused it. Yes. I mean, but this was not the last time we saw you because you moved to TNA where you had that huge tag match against Awesome Kong. Oh, Freaking Awesome God. Kong. Phenomenal. She's <laughs> class act. She's one of the best. She really, really is. I was terrified because I hadn't been in the ring forever. And then on top of that, I didn't have that much in-ring experience to begin with. And here I am going to wrestle with Kia. And she was like... <laughs> Girl, don't worry about that. I got you. I got you. That's all she said. I got you. And I was like, okay, okay. Yeah, TNA was great. The problem with TNA is that my relationship with Bobby started falling apart. So Mm. unfortunately, politics come into play and they hired him, not me. And that was it. That was the end of it for TNA with me. When you first walked into TNA, did you have plans to be in in the ring a little bit more? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. If um, that's the direction that... You know, Dixie wanted to go and the writers wanted to go. I would absolutely have explored it for sure. Got it, got it. I was a little bit intimidated with the six-sided ring. But I think right after I got there, they switched it out. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, I was not opposed to it. After that, you uh, stepped away from wrestling. But, you know, the happy thoughts. What did you love most about your experience in pro wrestling? Honestly, like the friendships that I've made, Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously I have two kids from the wrestling business. They're freaking the light of my life. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's helped me develop into the woman that I am today. Also, it's helped with some of my film endeavors that I've worked on. I shot a movie called Blood Circus with Tom Sizemore. I shot that about three years ago. Okay. And it was awesome. I got to use some of my wrestling skills. <laughs> nice. In a fight scene with Tom Sizemore, which was amazing. And hopefully more work will come in the future. Life happens. And you just got to pull from it what you will and apply it to your life and not sweat the small stuff. And it's all good. Everything. It was a good experience. I learned a lot. I have lifelong friends. And we'll see where that leads me. And now looking into the current women's division now, what's your thought on how the women's division has developed? And who would you say is like one or two person that you want to get in the ring with? I love 
the direction of the women's division. I think that sometimes as women, when we try to go out and prove ourselves that we can get as dirty as the boys, we can rough and tumble, we can do all of these things, we forget the most basic and the most primal thing that we can do, which is be feminine and be female and be the neck that turns the head. I say that to say this, I feel like the women's division is lacking some really strong manipulative managers and um, matchmakers. And I feel like we need more of that. We need a God. very strong feminine presence, maybe possibly even managing a brand. Who knows? I think you should come back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not opposed to it. <laughs> is there anyone in the roster that you might want to manage or get in the ring with? Charlotte Flair, Sasha Banks, and I, I think we could have a really good rivalry. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. I think that would be epic. Oof. <laughs> I could see it for sure. Yeah, I think those two would be barn burners for sure. When is like the time that you get like tinkle for <laughs> wrestling? Itch. <laughs> the itch, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the itch for wrestling. When do you get that? <laughs> I get hyped up when I watch like old wrestling matches. My kids sometimes they'll show me YouTube videos of myself and old matches ah. and stuff like that. And then I'll get hyped up and I'll be like, damn, I wish you would have did this instead of that. <laughs> or I should have said this or this would have been great if. I love watching that stuff, like the nostalgia behind it. I get really, really excited for sure. <laughs> and also, honestly, anytime I watch some of Kurt Angle's old matches, that gets ah. me really hyped up. What are your kids' favorite moment of you in wrestling? Do you know? My kids have a hard time processing that I was a diva, especially oh. with the character that I played. They actually mm -hmm. didn't really know until probably a couple of years ago. Okay. They kind of they spent their time infatuated with their dad and kind of seeing him as the wrestler and being larger than life. And then I'll never forget one of my girlfriends came over to the house. Her daughter had her phone and was pulling up YouTube and my daughter's eyes got so big and she was like, that's you? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And my son watched it and he put the phone down, he put his head down, and he's like, I don't want to see that again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very different reaction. Yeah, they have a hard time kind of like processing it, so small doses. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Crystal, thank you so much for this interview. And what do you want to say for all the fans to this day is obsessed with you, they love you, they love your feeling me, the strut. What do you want to tell them? <sighs> I just want to say thank you so much for loving me and supporting me and being there for me since day one. It means so much. You have no idea. And continue to follow me on social media outlets because who knows what the future is going to hold. Maybe one day I'll end up in the ring. Maybe I'll end up on the big screen. We don't know. But thank you from the bottom of my heart. Continue to follow your dreams. Continue to think for yourself. Continue to research. And continue to follow your dream. That's thank it. You.